and welcome to Artifacts, the monthly show in which we talk about the arts in Minneapolis. We've got some very interesting guests here to talk about what I'm going to say is expression, how people get ideas, how they put those ideas out in front of people, and uh, what people think about them. Later on, we're going to be talking about uh, the Playwright Center with two guests from there, uh, Bill Corbett and Buffy Sedlicek. But first, we've got two guests here who've been working with some young people on murals in a couple of different sites, and I'm really excited to talk with them. We've got Adrian Garza. Hi, thanks for coming. Thank you. And Heidi Williams? Thanks. Now, Heidi, you're with an organization called FANS, and I understand that FANS had a lot to do with getting Adrian and his brother Guillermo and some other people together to do some murals. Before we talk about the artwork, can you tell us a little bit about FANS and what it is and what FANS does? Sure. FANS is um, a group of 60 Minneapolis youth, and they started with the FANS program two years ago. And that, at that time, they were all in sixth grade. And um, the goal for fans is to get them through high school and get them into college. And if they go through it and get through high school, get that diploma, and then they'll have a college scholarship. Um, to be involved in fans, they set goals in four areas every six months. And those areas are to contribute to their community, to be sexually healthy and chemically, or chemically healthy and sexually responsible, and to get good grades in school. So they set goals in those areas. So this mural project, um, it, it worked along with f the fans' priorities and outcomes really well in that um, they're giving something back to their community. And throughout the year, what we try to do is get them involved, youth involved, in build interest, um, build self-esteem, and um, in areas that they're, they have, do have interests in, like Adrian with art or you know if it's performing arts or some it's athletics and so throughout the year there's all different projects that um, they're working on. Sounds like a wonderful program. How, when did it start? How old is the program it's itself? It's two years old. Oh so it's new? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it works primarily with young people from what Minneapolis? Yeah. Or from uh -huh. There's um, two case managers that work north side and there's two that work south side. I work um, basically in the Phillips community. Mm -hmm. And so we work with the families and with the 15 youth, there's 60 youth all Okay, all so 15 involved. at each of the, mm -hmm. the four mm -hmm. focus areas. And Adrian, you're one of them. Yeah. That's right. And now murals is just one of the projects of all of these goals that have been set and things like that. Let's talk a little bit about murals. I believe we've got a, a tape of uh, at least a few of the murals that you've been involved in. Maybe we can take a look at that now mm -hmm. and you can describe for us what we're going to look at and uh, how it happened, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we're going to be taking a look at the uh, murals where up on the NERC building, I think this is, up mm -hmm. in North Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here? Yeah, these are different races of people getting together to help stop you know, crime and stuff, like that's representing the community. So they can like kick out violence, drug related stuff, you know, take it out of the neighborhood. So, and these are just like some of the persons, you know, their different nationalities getting together, no racism stuff. You okay, know. I think I see your name right there. Yeah, this is, that's Guillermo, Isaac, Monty, me, Adrian, and um, Courtney. Courtney. Okay. And Guillermo's your brother. Yeah, Guillermo's my brother. And as I understand it, he was what would you call it, the lead artist? Yeah, he was the main person. Okay. And this right here is the other side. It's drug dealers, gang members, and, you know, stuff and the, the violence, you know. Mm -hmm. And this, the silhouette of people that's in black are have chains around them pulling them out of the north side, you know, getting them out of there. Silhouette symbolizes the community yeah. taking them out of the yeah. all the crime and out drugs of the out of yeah. the north side. Well, that out sounds of the really community. positive. Now, where are we here? This is the White House in Minneapolis, South Side. Okay. And this is Community Unity. Um, it has a uh, Aztec representing the Me Mexican community and other stuff, you know, mm -hmm. for others. And the uh, peace sign for Americans, feathers for Indians. The onk for blacks, for African Americans. Great. Now I'm really interested to know how you get the ideas. How, you know, we see it on the wall and it looks good. How do the ideas come to you as an artist and Guillermo and the others? Um, 
we picture it as like what we would want up there, like if it was for us. Mm -hmm. So we do it like it's for, it's mostly like we do it for ourselves. We want that up there mainly to get publicity, but we also like it when you like driving by, you know, seeing, oh, I did that. So we just draw it down on the sketch and then we look it up and then we make it like enlarging it in our minds. Now in a minute I want to talk about how it gets from a sketch pad up on a big wall because I think a lot of people don't know that. But first I want to ask Heidi, um, I know up at NERC to, you got some of the people at work around there involved with what kind of content, what themes to talk about. Right. How'd you do that? At all the locations um, we were connected with a contact person to talk to and we would meet with that person and talk about ideas and concepts and what they want communicated on these walls. So the NERC building actually, Guillermo did a few, <coughs> excuse me, um, rough drafts and brought them back. We went to maybe four meetings and at that building we met with B.J. Wright and she, had, she wanted community representation on one wall and an anti-drug and taking it out of the north side, the drug and crime on yeah, the other wall. That's just what Adrian mm -hmm. was talking about with mm -hmm. the chains pulling those kinds of activities yeah. out of that community mm -hmm. but leaving the people that live there with a more positive mm -hmm. kind of thing. We have a, a few examples of some of the first drafts okay. for these walls. Now these are um, sketches, if you will, that were done by Guillermo, mm -hmm. your brother. Yeah. Um, this right here is the one we, he mm -hmm. wanted like to do but the lady didn't want it because it really didn't represent what they really wanted. Mm -hmm. So this was for the drug-related side. Okay, and now can you tell us before we flip what the words say in here? I'm not sure if the camera will pick that up, but... Well, that says, help stop the crime before it's too late. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, anti-drug mm -hmm. com community. And that's like a gang member of drug dealers, you know. Mm -hmm. And here goes the side. He did another draft, rough draft, because she didn't want that. And this is the one that you've just seen, but they're just separated. Okay. You know, the silhouette of people is pulling them out mm -hmm. and says crime, crime su supporters, you know, mm -hmm. they want crime supporters, so pull out the violence, drug-related drug stuff, you know, gangs. So these guys are getting pulled out. And this right here is, um, she, he had another draft for the other side too, but she didn't like that one either. So he did three for the other side, but the one we see where so we will stick together. Um, this is the one with races on there, different races. Mm -hmm. This is the one right in here. Yeah, the bottom one. Mm -hmm. And he drew them, and you know their their community is sticking together. So that's so, the draft she liked. So you work with the people to help get the ideas, and then there's back and forth. You you work work together to figure out what kind of images you want mm -hmm. to put up there. Well, now mm -hmm. here's the question that is of interest to me. Something that relatively this small in the sketchbook is here and, and Guillermo can work on that. Mm -hmm. How do you make it go from here up onto a big wall that's, you know, 20 feet by 100 feet or whatever? Um, well, it, you got to, to, in your mind, this is how he works. In his mind, he's, you know, he, he likes art real, a lot. In his mind, he can just picture it, like, really big. So he just looks at he has it in his mind like a copy. It's really big, and he just copies it. You know, he just thinks that it's big, and so he does it. Big. He just has that talent to yeah. be able to get up there. Now, how does he work then with other people? He's got it in his mind. How yes. does he get you and and the other folks you mentioned to help put the paint on the wall? Um. Well, we went to workshops, help trying to do it. You know, practicing so he can. And then he started teaching us like, this is how you're supposed to do it. Pick this kind of paint because if not, it's gonna run and have to go over it and stuff. You know. Mm -hmm. So he just like talked to the people and told them that that's what, you know, like, just do this and, and try. Don't give up. It'll work. Okay, so he's not only an artist, but he's a teacher. I mean, mm, he helps yeah. people learn how to do this. Now, he's your brother. Uh, how old is he? He's 16. 16, and you're how old? 13. Okay, and most of the other kids that were working on this are about the same age? Yeah. And all, all involved with fans? fans. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. All the apprentices were fans uh -huh. Participants. Uh, how has the community responded to these new murals? Uh, they, they like it. Yeah. Yeah, we've had a great response at the um, NARC building. I, they had a small dedication at the end of the day, and at that point, Guillermo was still working on the second mural, and um, probably 
50 or 60 people showed up for that dedication. Throughout the days, people drive by, people are coming by taking pictures. You know, even youth in that community have come by and really asked a lot of questions. How did you get to do this? You know, it's really, I think it's even given them um, some feeling that they could do something like that themselves also. Well, you obviously had something to do with organizing this. I mean, someone had to get hold of the paint and get permission to put it on the wall and all that. Can you describe a little bit of that in case anybody is interested in knowing what goes in, besides the artistry, what goes into making a mural happen in a community? Okay. Well, first they needed to get the money, so they got that through the Minneapolis Arts Commission. And in the proposal was proposed that um, Guillermo would teach his art form to three or four Minneapolis youth in the Fran FANS project. <clears throat> um, from there, Guillermo and I set up interviews and met with youth and they had an application and he had one question that he wanted to ask them and the one question was, would you do it if no money was involved? There was a small stipend involved for the kids that were participating. Um, from that point, he selected who would work with him. Uh, we set up workshops. Um, we bought most of our paint. We just went to local stores. We found that they had the cheapest prices and the best selection. And there was a certain paint that he likes to use. So the, the local stores had the kind of paint that Guillermo liked to work with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so at first we got hassled a little bit. And then after the first mural, and Guillermo was in the um, paper, we went back in there and they said, hey, you were the guy from the mural. And so they were helping us out at that point. So there was really actually a response, a positive response outside of where the mural was done and a larger scale. So, How many it's, have you done now through fans? How many murals? Through fans, there was um, a local artist that worked with another fans case manager earlier this year, starting in November of uh, 90. Oh. And they did one at Phillips, well, at, there's actually two murals mm -hmm. at the Phillips Community Center. And then Guillermo actually did one more for this project. It's called Hair with Flair, and it was um, for a local beauty salon. And that just says Hair with Flair. He met with the owner, that's what she wanted. And okay. So that was the first, and that was kind of a tester. And they all got to um, really find out how it works, how this medium, how the spray paint works on mm -hmm. a brick wall. And that was, that was a good project for them to um, so get used So the people to. might get a chance to actually see these. Could you let us know where are they? Now I know you've mentioned NERC and that's up on? Plymouth and Emerson. Okay, in North Minneapolis. North mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Wade House is located on 26th Street and 13th Avenue. In the Phillips neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And Hair with Flair is on 38th Street and 27th Avenue. That's great. Adrian, what's next? What else are you going to be working on, uh, whether it's through fans? I mean, you're going to continue with your art? And mm, yeah, we're going to try, like, you know, tr um, well, m me and my brother are going to, like, try to airbrush on canvas for our room, see if, if people can see it, and, and if people like it, you know, hopefully we'll, like, they'll want stuff, you know. Great. So in a few years, uh, you've had this experience. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have uh, any thoughts about what you want to be doing in four or five years? Mm, well, I know my brother wants to be an artist. I would like to, but it seems kind of difficult now. Well, I see a lot of art, and I don't really like it because so, it seems too, you know, simple. Yeah. But, well, that and also we, what, what was I going to say? I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh, what kind of art you like? And Oh, no, I was going to say there's, um, there's, there, it's not that simple. You can't just jump into it. You gotta like practice before you start. You get a little training and experience. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like through fans, at least you're getting some of that, and mm -hmm. it's been good for some of the others. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you both very much for being here. It's been really interesting, and I hope people get a chance to uh, go up and see the uh, the art and that you carry on your good work. Mm -hmm. well, okay. Thank you. Well, thanks, Adrian. All right, Appreciate yep. it a lot. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Heidi, thanks. Okay. Well, we'll be back in a moment, but before uh, we bring in our next guests, I wanted to. Take a moment and look at this interesting fact. Welcome back. 
uh, behind that fact you were just looking at was a shot of the uh, front of the Playwright Center, which is on East Franklin Avenue, and which I understand is celebrating its 20th anniversary since it was started uh, in the very early 70s. And we've got two guests with us for this part of the show. We've got Bill Corbett and we have uh, Buffy Sedlicek from the Playwright Center. Both of you write, and I believe both of you act as well. Mm -hmm. So thanks and welcome for being here. Um, I want to talk with Bill a little bit about what you're doing this summer. I know there's some events, but before we do that, I thought we'd talk a little bit about the Playwright Center and what it's all about and what goes on there. Buffy, what does the Playwright Center offer to writers and playwrights and those well, kind of people? I think it's real. what's exciting about the Playwright Center, which is going to be 20 years old this year, is that it was founded by playwrights. And um, it is an organization of playwrights. And we, the playwrights are the, you know, we have a board of directors and all that sort of thing. But the playwrights really, it has playwrights possessive case center. So the playwrights really are in charge of it. It is a group of playwrights who are offering services to other writers. It's, um, so the playwrights the help view that we need develop the programs. To have of the center. Yes, we help develop the programs. And um, the services that are offered to working writers are workshops and cold readings and staged readings. There are opportunities to work in outreach and education, which is a strong component of the Playwright Center as well. Um, Bill, help. <laughs> what else? Well you're, well, you're part of a, a program that's coming up in August, uh, mm -hmm. the Play Labs. Yeah, starting next week, in fact. Um, and I'd say it's one of the kind of the centerpiece events of the Playwright Center year. Um, it's pr one of the more national things. It develops four, five, five this year, sometimes six uh, plays. Gets the playwrights into this town, uses a company of professional actors, among which Buffy is this year and um, has about two weeks of rehearsal, culminates in a staged reading at, uh, at the University of Minnesota, using some of the top directors in town and in the nation. Okay, so, and what particular are you working on? You, you have one particular show? a play show? called Motorcade, which is happening, directed, directed by Kent Stevens, who's a local director, works at Brass Tacks a lot. Um, and it's a two-character play, and I'm actually going to be acting in it as well. So I guess this is the plug session. <laughs> <laughs> that counts. It's an, um, all the plays are happening Friday and Saturday, August 9th and 10th over at the U. And um, it's an interesting array of styles and, and writers there, and certainly some good actors to watch. Well, great. Now, Buff, you mentioned uh, cold readings and stage readings, and for some folks that may be watching, What's the difference between those kinds of readings and a full-blown production in which all the tech and uh, the rehearsals are done? What are those kind of Well, readings? script in hand for the actors, for one thing. Okay. And I think a real process-driven uh, kind of experience for the writer and the actor as well is, you know, we're real, really considering the work is still being in process. A lot of the work that happens, at, I love the Midwest Play Labs, it's an incredible program. I've participated as an actor and as a writer in the program, and I think it's our sexiest, most <laughs> public, uh, best known program, perhaps. And um, nevertheless, I think some of the very exciting work that happens at the Playwright Center happens underground, so to speak, mm. you know, in these private workshops, the moments where an actor, a dramaturg, director, and playwright come together in a, in a room to really wrestle out the potential and the challenges that exist in a script in its current form. And by the time you get to production, of course, one of the big things is that you add the final collaborator, which is the audience at that point, you know. So it starts the process from almost maybe just past the point where the, the writer, the playwright is coming up with the idea and you get mm -hmm. these folks in there to help them really, as you say, wrestle with it and work it out and then finally give them an opportunity to get some kind of an audience yeah. to listen to it. And, then, and that's still in the process then. Mm -hmm. Keep going back and working it and working it. My point of view is that theater is a collaborative mm -hmm. art form and that as writers, if we closet ourselves away from opportunities such as those that exist at the Playwright Center, 
we may be less able to communicate with the society with whom we are attempting to communicate. And mm. working with those, those collaborators, those actors, and the other writers, colleagues, you know, um, and dramaturgs and directors is really valuable. And the resources of the Playwright Center, I think, uh, well, let me say, without the resources of the Playwright Center, I do not think that I would have moved as far and as fast mm. as a writer. Mm -hmm. The opportunities afforded there through the support of the Jerome Fellowships, the McKnight Fellowships, um, the artist-in-residency opportunities. Um, Can you the describe classes? each of those a little bit? Now, the, the fellowships you mentioned, that helps. Right. Uh, you, you both had fellowships, as I understand it. We've both been Jerome Fellows. Okay. And, and what does that mean? What is a Jerome Fellow uh, for is? folks that don't know? Take it, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm coming off two years of Jerome Fellowship, and uh, there are different tiers of, of fellowships available through the Playwright Center. The Jerome Fellowship, in a way, is the first step uh, for emerging writers and um, requires you to be in residency here. And um, I'm not originally from here. I came out here for the Jerome Fellowship. Oh, so that literally brought you to this literally. area because of the center mm -hmm. I mean, and the program. Sure. Here. Okay. Um, I was from uh, back east. I was I'm from Brooklyn, New York, so I was a long way from home. Um, but, and I was unsure coming here, frankly, about it, but it proved to be extremely valuable to have two what years. What exactly of, has it done for you? I mean, you're here, obviously it got you to a new mm -hmm. state, and it's allowed you to work in your writing and... Yeah, well, on the, on the real crass level, it's, it's given me <laughs> some money <laughs> to, to float well. me through. And, I mean, I'm saying it's crass, but it's literally the difference between having writing time and not. It's bought you some time. Sure. You it sounds like you've had the same experience, and it's yes. given you that opportunity. I moved here because of the Playwright Center. No, where are you from? In 1983, I okay. came here. Mm -hmm. um, and prior to that, I'd been living in Wisconsin and working in professional theater yeah. in other areas of the Midwest and making little forays into the Twin Cities, particularly to go to the Playwright Center. And the different casing things the and joint. Yeah, casing the joint. <laughs> casing the joint. And, and it drew you in, and, and it, it sounds did. like you've been involved in a lot of the programs. I have. Artists in Residency, is this one that right. you've done? Right, um, through the art outreach. Okay, what is that? Of the Playwright uh, Center. Well, one of the aspects of the Playwright Center that I personally find very exciting is the commitment to education. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and we do a lot of residencies uh, throughout the state of Minnesota. And um, I don't know how many we do, but throughout the year we, we mm -hmm. do these one or two or three week residencies in schools working with young people in the area of writing and creating plays, team teaching with mm -hmm. the, te the classroom teachers, in, which is an exciting way in which to work. And then in the summer, we also have the Young Playwrights Summer Conference, which is a three-week um, program. It's a camp, kind of, you know, I guess you could Centered call at it. Centered at the Playwrights Center? No, it takes place on the campus of the College of St. Thomas. Oh. And uh, this this year, Bill and I were the playwright co-chairs of the conference, and Sally McDonald is uh, the administrator of the program, okay. staff person at the Playwright Center. And on behalf of the center. On behalf of the center, oh. and um, we're coordinated with College of St. Thomas, and we have participants from across the nation. So it's a national, is there anything like this elsewhere? I mean, you've come from Brooklyn, you've come all the way from Wisconsin, I mean. I think the Playwright Center is unique in the country. There are areas in the country, there are other organizations that offer at one point or another parts of what we do. Okay. Mm -hmm. But nothing is comprehensive. But nothing is comprehensive as the Playwright Center the with as small a budget as the Playwright right. Center as well. Yeah. I mean it's really amazing Pretty what efficient. we're able to accomplish. Right. And of course the closest thing I would say is new dramatists in New York. Mm. But that doesn't have the outreach component, as far as I understand, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have the, the fellowship programs. It mm -hmm. does have like a reading series. Um, and, and there are certainly outreach programs through theaters that are comparable. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think as far as all that under one roof and you know, emanating nationally, the Playwright Center right is pretty unique. And well, we've got time for maybe one more quick question. Mm -hmm. And I just, I've, we've got you here. What are audiences going to see in the next few years? Are there trends, new things coming up in theater, new topics, small cast, large cast? What, what's on the horizon for theater? <laughs> oh, boy. Excellent uh, question. <laughs> great question. I think um, 
we've seen a little response recently to some funding issues by some mm. cutting back on the part of some writers. I don't think that's a trend that's mm. going to continue. Um, uh, I don't. I don't feel comfortable predicting trends because there are things. There are always, since the 50s, as far as I know, and probably since the since the first person stood up and said, "This is a play." It, there have always been people who want to be outside what the mainstream is mm. doing and calling themselves the trendsetters, and they are the people who lead us to the next stage of mainstream, basically. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Okay. You know. I, I think I see patterns repeat themselves in the last 30 years. But exciting times ahead, basically confident. I think, I think ideally, exciting young writers. Ideally, theater's going to capitalize on what's really theatrical, and the other media can't really give. Um, I think that would be the smart and, and the wise thing to do, and I hope, mm -hmm. I hope it happens. Um, the, the unwise thing, which you see here and there, is that it'll try to be television junior or, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, an adjunct to the movies. But okay. know, there's Go a lot ahead. going on, a lot on the Good table comments. now. Thank you both for being here, Buffy. Thanks, Bill. Bill. Bill, thanks. Appreciate Thank you having much. you here. Now, if you want more information about any of the things we talked about in this show, you can call the Arts Commission at six seven three three zero zero six. And don't go away because at the very end of this show, there'll be a calendar of some upcoming events this month. Thank you very much for watching Artifacts. We'll see you again.